Chapter 71 The Butler Did It He walks at a stately clip, his hand cobbled shoes tapping on the ornate stone of the floor as he moves with great speed alongside the main buffet table where he reaches over and grabs the vial of poison from the assassin attempting to spike the punch. He pockets it quickly and continues on his way before transferring the serving tray to his other hand. It's a simple spread with merely some bourbon and shot glass alongside a few hors d'oeuvre. There are cheeses, of course, as well as a small charcuterie platter alongside some carpaccio and a few oysters with some samplings of olives and small pickles on toothpicks with a crusty loaf cut into small slices. Basic finger food to offset the sheer blandness of the buffet table. It had been rather interesting to learn that the locals have much more sensitive taste buds. It matched rather well with their utterly pathetic resistance to toxins. A patch of poison ivy would likely cause agony on a scale to have most contemplating suicide rather than merely a few days or weeks of aggravation. He had also heard stories of peppers that were somewhere between jalapenos and habaneros actually killing alien women, or more likely shocking them hard enough to aggravate a pre-existing condition with fatal results. Purest pain on the tongue in an unexpected manner could cause an already frail heart, caused by a lifetime of indulgence and a lack of self-care, to seize or stop. Rather unkind of you, he remarks as he confiscates a dagger that resembles a stiletto from a younger-looking member of the serving staff and quickly tucks it away. He homes in on Admiral Cistern, who's helping guide Ambassador Tal through a slow dance by allowing her to stand on his shoes. Rather kind of him, though that will mean that Philip will have to send someone to polish them again after this. They might be scuffed. A plasma pistol being withdrawn from yet another assassin's sleeve is confiscated with nary a word and vanishes within an interior pocket of his tailed coat, reminding the proper old man just how useful Axiom is as normally he would be running rather short on space for equipment, both planned and confiscated on the field. As it is, the entire ensemble looks respectable, fits comfortably, and he can carry an entire armory's worth of equipment. Dr. Cuthens would have given his left arm and leg to have access to so effective a trick back in the olden days, the filthy Southpaw Cretan of a mad genius. He sniffs and dismisses the memory of fast cars, faster women, and the air thick with bullets and threats. Glory days they may have been, but no one had been more shocked than Philip himself when he reached retirement age. An activation device that, despite its alien construction, is clearly the ignition of a bomb is plucked from clumsy fingers and safely stored away as the gentle blues song dies down. An Admiral Cistern, seeing Philip approaching, has started to make his way to a side table with his date. Although it was rather amusing to think that formidable strategist and tactician was the technical arm candy in this exchange. The mental image of his commanding officer in a glittering red gown is snuffed out before it fully forms. Good evening, sir. I do hope you're enjoying the celebrations, he says, walking up to the happy couple. Might I add that you both, how is it said, cut a fine rug, he asks, and Ambassador Tal just looks baffled as Admiral Cistern smirks. I suppose we did he remarks with a nod before glancing to his considerably shorter but very ripe, green-skinned dance partner. It's slang for dancing, to dance so well you cut the rug. He explains to her and she nods before looking up towards the platter that is no doubt towering from her perspective. What have you brought? she asks. Just a few more human agreeable refreshments. While the locals have laid out a fine feast, it is rather bland and unappetizing to human tastes. Our heavy resistance to toxins means our sense of taste is rather dull by comparison, and while the repast available to all guests is healthy enough, merely healthy is not enough for an officer and a gentleman. Proper fare provides nourishment to body, mind, and soul, Philip explains. Excellent, Sir Philip, you're a saint among sinners. 
Admiral Cistern says as Philip lowers the plate and presents the meal to him. A quick uncapping of the bourbon and he fills the glass halfway up. Oh, pish posh, sir, I'm merely the butler, Philip counters. What is all this? Ambassador Tal asks, and Philip allows a thin smile to cross his face. Alas, it is a simple repast. The drink is bourbon, a type of whiskey made from corn and fermented in a barrel of charred oak. It is known for its rich flavor and has at minimum 80 proofs, or 40% alcohol. From what I understand the sampling I just poured Admiral Cistern would prove rather lethal to you, madam. My apologies. I am, however, willing to compensate by fetching any number of drinks or snacks you require. Perhaps later, though I am rather interested in what the rest of these are. She states and doesn't notice that Admiral Cistern has noticed his little note under the glass and is reading it. Of course, madam, these are cheeses a... I'm aware of how cheeses are made, but not familiar with these types. Merely some cheddar, mozzarella, Havarti, and Gouda. Unfortunately, we're rather cut off from more proper cheeses. Sir Philip explains as he wrinkles his nose in distaste. It's fine, Sir Philip, Admiral Cistern tries to assure him. His waving of his left hand with the note held against his downwards palm with his thumb indicates he's read and memorized the contents of the quick report. It most certainly is not. Philip nearly hisses as he grabs Admiral Cistern's hand to place the bourbon glass in it. He also takes the time to vanish the point form report. A man of your station deserves to have a finer repast than simple cheddar. You represent an entire world. You shouldn't be... He visibly takes a moment to get control of himself and notices that Admiral Cistern sips the bourbon with two fingers extended, the smallest, and ring. Option two, it is then. My apologies, sir. To you as well, Ambassador Tao. It was unbecoming of me. No apologies needed, Sir Philip. This trip has been stressful in numerous ways to each and every one of us. Indeed, sir. Now, Madame Tal, to the rest of the platter, we have a carpaccio, thinly sliced raw meats, in this case, beef sirloin with lemon, olive oil, salt, and pepper for seasoning. Where these here are half-shelled oysters, a form of shellfish, as you can plainly see. This here is a charcuterie, a variety of smoked meats accompanied by several fine mustards, a type of potent sauce with a variety of uses. These here are olives, a form of small fruit that is a staple in a wide variety of diets. Next to them are pickles, a type of preserved vegetable rendered delightfully sour by the process. And the last bit is some bread as a cleanser. Why is it that this one platter looks better than the entire buffet table? Ambassador Tal asks him hands on her hips and a smile on her face. We have excellent chefs in competition for whom is the most competent amongst their number. Philip answers and she giggles. Perhaps this would serve you, madam. I apologize that it isn't suitably gilded and will stand out among our surroundings. However, it will prove most useful. He says, drawing a small bioscanner out from a pocket in his tailcoat and presents it to her. It's already keyed to your species, madam, he says, and she offers him a toothy smile. The lips of the gobies stretch wide enough to be disturbing. He glances away from the ambassador who's now unknowingly stepped into the uncanny valley. Is something wrong? Admiral Cistern asks. No, sir, but perhaps I should fetch the lady a drink as she examines the fare, Philip offers. Oh my goodness, the bourbon is that toxic? She asks in shock. I'll leave you to it. Do you have any preference of drink, milady? Philip asks and she simply stares in fascination at the readout. Admiral Cistern gives a slight nod and he walks off smartly to retrieve the lady a drink, also to disarm a young serving girl with a dart gun, another who has what appears to be an automated launcher in her groomed head feathers. He steals a vial of poison and casually takes away a recording device that was painfully obvious off the bottom of the table. He fills up a crystal wine glass halfway places it upon a tray and walks smartly back to his admiral. 
He also takes another detonator from another wanton anarchist and rolls his eyes in sheer disappointment. These children truly define the term incompetent. No doubt not a single one of them has ever been in a high-stakes shootout for the codes to a weapon of mass destruction using only a pistol in one hand while attempting to properly captain a speedboat with the other. He tries to imagine some of these would be assassins and agents in the situations he had found himself in, and the only result running through his mind is a wet smear or a cooling corpse. In all likelihood, he'd have to work extra hard to ensure that both Herbert and Harriet are good and ready for when he heads back home. He shoots his hand out and grabs young distortion by a protruding flap that helps protect his ear canal and drags the incompetent little spy with him. I see you found our friend again, Philip. Admiral Cistern remarks and Ambassador Tao looks up from her study of the Dijon mustard. Your drink, madam. I do hope it is a preferred type. He says, holding out the tray to Ambassador Tao who takes it with a thankfully closed mouth smile. Then she looks to where his left hand is holding on to Mr. Orshan's ear flap. Is that Mr. Orshan again? She asks in a somewhat strained tone of voice. I believe so, yes. Philip replies. How are you two doing that? She asks in complete puzzlement. That's what I'd like to know, Distortion says. Hush, this is the time for adults, young man. Until you can perform the duties you are paid to do without consistently failing, you will never grow into yourself. Philip replies with a sniff. I'm 26, the cloak and man snarls, and I'm rapidly approaching 80. You are a hatchling boy. It's not the years, it's the mileage you old. The upset young cloak and begins and receives a painful shake. Then I'm approaching my thousandth century. You would do well to listen to your elders. I did. I'm not standing on a carpet. Let me go for pity's sake. He protests and Philip complies. Very well then. Here is another pearl of wisdom, young man. Some people pay an enormous amount of attention to their surroundings. These are usually spies of some sort or those who believe themselves to be targeted by spies. These people are prone to notice unusual things even if they cannot physically see them. This is especially true to those with the slightest amount of axiom training. You're both adepts? Yes and no. I'm not going to clarify, but for love of queen and country act as if your invisibility does not work. It will help you enormously. Pretend you are visible and reassess your strategies. You've relied so much upon this crutch that... Philip stops himself from mentioning the brat's cologne. He takes a breath gets an unfortunate whiff of the mess and then makes a shooing gesture. The boy all but sprints off and barely dodges a party guest. So aside from the clowns mocking your skills, are you enjoying the day? Admiral Cistern asks. Indeed, sir. I've made a very close friend by merely explaining the purposes of a sensory deprivation pod. They're quite the chatty type, but they know a great many interesting things about a great many people. He then leans in. Especially our dear speaker of the council, he says in a conspiratorial voice. He then watches as the gears behind Ambassador Tal's eyes churn at lightning speed before her eyebrows go up, and she then quickly steals her expression. Not bad. A bit of training and she'd make an acceptable spy in just a few months. No more than a year at any rate. 